Next lesson is going to regard shareholder litigation, and we're kind of opening the door to the next way that shareholders can effectuate their rights. We just finished talking about how shareholders can vote, how they can cause other shareholders to vote through the precatory proposal process. They can also have the company vote on matters other than board seats. And so that kind of rounded out our conversation about the shareholder rights to vote. But now the shareholders also have a right to sue. And in this way, they can also, it's sort of a stick, right? Management is going to be afraid, not just of shareholders voting them out, but they don't want to get sued either. And so another power that shareholders come is this threat of lawsuit. <coughs> and the first lesson, the first thing to understand in um, dealing with shareholder lawsuits is that they come in effectively two flavors, direct and derivative. So our first lesson in shareholder lawsuits is what are they? And why do they come in these two different versions? And how do you determine which procedure should be advanced at any given time? I'm going to start this off by a conversation on the debate on shareholder litigation. Not everyone is so sure it's such a great thing. And there's definitely an ongoing debate about whether shareholder litigation is good as a policy matter, whether it's good for shareholders, good for the country. Uh, I mean, there's issues where you know, it could potentially be good for no one except the lawyers is kind of the accusation uh, there. Then we're going to talk about the difference between a direct right and a derivative right. And I'm going to try to simplify this for you and give you a list of rights that are generally direct and would require a direct lawsuit, which is a type of class action. Or, on the other hand, rights that are the companies that the shareholder only enjoys derivatively and which are the subject of derivative lawsuits, which uh, require an entirely different process uh, for them to, to, to go forward. And in fact, that process will be more a subject that we cover today because class actions are things you'll learn about in civil procedure. The rules for class actions pertain to corporations are not fundamentally different from, uh, from share. I mean, many class actions are against corporations for obvious reasons, deep pockets, and shareholder litigations are not fundamentally different from those. But derivative litigations, those are fundamentally different because now you're having the corporation sue itself and you're actually usurping management power to a certain extent. And just like shareholder voting, especially for precatory proposals that were highly forceful, that takes the power from the board, gives it to the shareholders, disrupts some of our theories of corporations in a fundamental way. I'm going to talk to you about Delaware's approach. I'm going to call it the Thule two-step. And uh, it's a very simple approach. And if you apply that, you can answer questions about whether or not a litigation is a direct or derivative, even if it's not one of the specifically delineated ones I'll identify for you today. You can use the Thule two-step test. We'll talk about class actions briefly in this section. Next section, we're going to talk about derivative litigation in more detail, especially as how derivative litigation in particular comes at odds with the business judgment rule which is a topic we'll cover in much more depth next class as we begin to talk about the actual rights that are being fought for. And I guess it bears mention, even at this kind of early uh, setting up the discussion, is that shareholders are suing because they've been harmed in some way. They've been harmed, they're suing who? They're suing directors. How do directors harm shareholders? Well, they harm them by violating duties. The directors owe duties to shareholders, owe duties to the corporation. And so this is really a, a, a lecture about uh, process, about procedure, but the procedure is to effectuate a substantive right. And so we'll spend the next three weeks or so, subsequent to today, learning about what exactly, I think it's more than, I think we spent four weeks total uh, learning about all the different ways shareholders have rights, and, in, and the flip side of that, all the ways that directors have duties to shareholders. But for now, we'll jump in with a conversation about uh, uh, whether or not shareholder litigation is really a, a good or, or a bad thing. So there's a debate over shareholder litigation. And the debate is mostly about whether or not uh, it's used as, as a, uh, a tool for the effectuation of rights of shareholders or whether it's something that uh, uh, powerful lawyers and law firms uh, do in order to um, essentially extort uh, value from shareholders. Excuse me for one sec, I have, my notes didn't pull, and I'm, I have a couple things I want to mention. Let me see if I can get them on my keynote on my iPhone. All right. 
Great. Yeah, they came. I was able to get those up there, so that's helpful. All right, so as I mentioned at the outset of this conversation, suing directors is one way for shareholders to get enforcement of the rights that they are owed, the duties that are owed to them. Uh, opinions are mixed because whether or not uh, the, the shareholders of the corporation generally profit from these or whether it really just drives down value, bogs down management and litigation, and ends up inuring most of the benefit of lawyers and court fees is an open question. So there's sort of a pro and a con to this story. And so on the pro side of things, people argue that uh, shareholder suits are fundamentally necessary because they deter management from doing bad things. They act as a really important deterrent. Um, uh, the flip side of that, though, is that this is a very expensive deterrent. Maybe there's a better way to stop management from doing bad things because the way that we have structured our litigation system is these are millions, tens of millions of dollars type of cases that take years and years to play out. On the pro side of the ledger, though, people say that, yeah, but the payout is to all shareholders equally. If it's a direct class action, then just like any class action, you get a, sec a portion of it depending on how much you are harmed. And if it's a derivative action, the company gets a lump sum, and that should increase the value of the company. So everyone benefits equally. But <clears throat> that's true, and it's not true. I mean, I just received a note that I was a, a, a potentially a beneficiary of a class action, and if I sent in some information, I could receive $4.93. Yeah? So let's go back to our rational apathy concept. <laughs> it's not worth my time. I mean, like to go, you know, to fill out the form, to, th to get $4.93. And a lot of these, actually, if you have a small shareholder, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, a couple bucks for an individual. And so a lot of people are not going to bother really enforcing their rights. And so it's not really true that everyone benefits equally because some people won't find it worthwhile to even go through the process. Very small shareholders will fall through the cracks, won't even um, be uh, informed. This does provide uh, compensation and provides uh, you know, a remedy where there have been damages. But 40% you know, of that remedy goes to the plaintiff's lawyer in most cases. By the way, these are almost always taken on contingency, always by large plaintiff's law firms who are usually located like a block from the courthouse in Southern District of New York, waiting for the stock to change and to file the complaint, the litigation. So, question again is like how much are the ordinary, I mean 40% is a big chunk of change for these rights to be effectuated. And so, is that really helping people? And then, kind of staying with the con side for a minute, why doesn't the SEC do this? I mean, don't we have effectively financial police? That's the SEC, right? The SEC could police all the companies. Okay, maybe, but problem with the SEC, well, for one thing, they don't always have the resources. Occasionally the federal government shuts down and they have none. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there and the SEC is going to go after the quote unquote the big fish, right? The large companies, the kind of big ticket items. They have a different set of incentives. Now, why does an attorney general go after a company? Well, maybe for justice, maybe because they want to run for governor. I don't know. Different reasons. And so the incentives may not perfectly line up. So having a private right of action does allow people to effectuate their rights in a way that just having a public right of action might not. But certainly an ongoing debate about there. In class actions in particular, there's a debate about whether or not uh, uh, this format allows attorneys to be what we'll call private attorneys general. I mean, that's the general argument for class actions and for contingency litigation, is that now we have all these attorneys, maybe some of you will do this, you will become <coughs> the police for America. And it's not just out of goodwill, it's out of rational incentives because you'll be paid well for following through on these type of litigations. 40% is a lot of recovery. But on the other hand, does that create the wrong incentives? Maybe incentives for frivolous litigation? Does that create incentives to sue someone just because you know you can get a settlement? If the cost of suing, of cost of defending are too high, <coughs> companies will be highly inclined just to settle, even a crummy case. And so you're not actually then encouraging people to be like watchdogs protecting America. You're then creating the problem. You're creating a class of individuals who are, are going around and essentially acting like the lunchroom bully who is shaking down the person who they most likely can get an extortion from. Um, you know, this, the argument for class actions, again, is that uh, you know, this means people are watching the securities markets and when stock price moves, 
People who have legal knowledge will quickly investigate to determine whether or not it moved because of wrongdoing. On the other hand, <laughs> stocks move all the time for all kinds of reasons. So are attorneys really even in the best position to be making these sort of assessments? Or are they going to make assessments based on other reasons, like how much of a settlement can I get? How long will it take me to get a pal in this litigation? Do I know someone who's a named shareholder? So definitely an ongoing debate about whether or not uh, uh, you know, class actions in particular are good or bad. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there was, an, there was a mind, so the question effectively was, does anyone really know <laughs> if, if, which story it is? Is it the good story or the bad story, right? Is, is this a white hat or a black hat story? Well, I don't think we know empirically. I think the debate is going on still, but as we'll see at the end of this mini lecture, the uh, Congress at least believed that there was too much securities litigation and passed the uh, uh, Private uh, Securities Litigation Reform Act. And, and that was based on at least their interpretation of studies that said there was too much frivolous litigation. We needed to make it harder to sue, created new standards in order to cut back how much litigation there was. It has been somewhat effective in doing that. There is a perception that the litigation arena is somewhat more fair. I guess I'm not up to date as to whether or not there's any like more contemporary scholarship. That law was 1995, and the scholarship leading up to it was from mid 80s and onward. Very different attitude, by the way, about shareholder activism at that time. A lot of conversations then about corporate raiders as opposed to shareholder activists. And so we have very much a cultural change in the interim. Um, it's, I guess it's fundamentally an empirical question that we may never know the answer, because how would you, I mean, it's very hard to prove a negative. How do you know that a litigation that should have been filed wasn't? You know, and so it's hard, sometimes hard to count some of those things. Well, since most of these firms work on a contingency basis, I don't know, it's hard to say. Maybe more lawyers are moving to the plaintiff's side because they're not finding the defendant's side very lucrative. Maybe if you have an abundance of plaintiff's side, I mean, I'm making this up. You guys chime in. Any, I mean, any other, feel free to add opinions here. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that in general, the fact that lawyers get paid less for defense work and have a harder time collecting, so long as they're still lawyers, that they might move to plaintiff's side. To the extent there are more plaintiff side lawyers, they will file more actions. That's what plaintiff's lawyers do. There might be more competition to file those actions. So I would imagine that, you know, the narrative I would tell is that the diminution in defense law firms, the difficulty in collecting fees would actually lead to an uptick in plaintiff side contingency litigation. Uh, all right, so uh, I did want to talk then briefly about what are these suits, and so we talked a little about whether they're good or bad. I'll leave it for you to think more about that, but they are. They exist, and so we have to do the work of uh, understanding exactly which type of suit we would proceed under. So my very general approach to this, and then I'll move into the Thule II step, which is the Delaware uh, codification of this approach, is that we have effectively direct rights. And direct rights, we can think of rights that shareholders have. And I like using this term, shareholders qua shareholders. Shareholders as shareholders. So it's just more memorable if you think direct rights are shareholders qua shareholders. And it means that they have rights that are effectively either statutory, contractual, or common law that are owed directly to them. And this has to do with, for example, a shareholder might have the right to receive, in effectively a contractual right, a right to receive a dividend payment if a condition occurs. And so that's a right that they are owed to receive that direct payment. They might have a direct right to vote, either at a shareholder meeting along with the rest of their class. But that's a right that they have. If you own a share of Microsoft, you have the right to vote for management. If the board screws with that right, whether by changing the meeting or by not mailing you a card or by lying about the options that you have in front of you, that violates your right as an individual shareholder. And those mostly pertain to rights of information, 
rights, the only, you know, the, the rights to getting financial access to in, information, uh, access to financial information, uh, voting, and certain aspects of governance and control. Those are direct rights because the shareholder holds those rights, whether because they have a contract that says they do, or because the statute says they do, or because the common law says they do. But those are rights of shareholders, qua shareholders, and then they would have to organize themselves into a class of similarly situated shareholders and sue in a direct class action. On the other side of the equation are derivative rights, and these are rights that shareholders have by virtue of being stockholders. These are rights that are really owed to the corporation. The corporation has the right to get, make, have directors that are paying attention. So the duty of care, right? The duty of care says the directors need to make good, informed business decisions. And so to effectuate that right, shareholders might sue on behalf of the company. And the reason we'll spend more time on derivative litigation is this means that the shareholders are, are effectively controlling the corporation in a very important way. The corporation, in a derivative suit, is suing its directors. Now, if the directors control the corporation, are they ever going to choose to sue themselves? Nobody wants to sue themselves. It doesn't work out very well. Okay, You're not going to win that one. So directors generally try to avoid director lawsuits. And if directors control the company, then director lawsuits would never happen. So derivative litigation is this particular quirk in corporate law where we have to have some mechanism for shareholders to effectuate the rights of the corporation when directors violate the duty to the corporation. So we'll learn about those uh, procedurally today, and then over the next month talk about what those are substantively, and then tie it together. So one uh, uh, case that was uh, very uh, illustrative on the point was uh, Tooley versus Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jenner Incorporated. And this case demonstrated Delaware's process in distinguishing between direct and derivative actions. And that's really your first step when you're dealing with the shareholder litigation. Which bucket does that get go into? Because that that determines many, many other aspects, both procedurally and substantively, what are the rights. And so we're going to make this as our first decision. So uh, brief on Thule. Uh, the case uh, involved Credit Suisse. So I have the image there. So Credit Suisse agreed to buy a company, uh, DLJ, in a cash tender offer. And um, uh, the, the majority holder of DLJ agreed to sell. They had 71%. Credit Suisse had uh, a right to delay the tender offer by 22 days, and they exercised this right. Apparently, this gave them some, uh, some, some advantage. Not clear what the advantage was, but um, they, they felt they had an advantage by, by waiting for this time. And the board, on uh, the behalf of DLJ, accepted the delay, which apparently harmed the value to DLJ shareholders. So DLJ shareholders are now going to get less money from the transaction. All right, so again, facts are a little complicated, but the simple version is you're the shareholder of DLJ, and when this merger happens, you get money. You get more money now than if the company waits 22 days. The company decides to wait 22 days. And now you're upset because instead of getting X dollars, you're getting X minus Y dollars getting less money. In this world, we all want as much money as possible. Right? It's just a, just a financial transaction. Now, a guy, a shareholder named Thule, sued the board of DLJ for violating its duties to him. He says, hey board, I'm suing you directly. Not derivatively, but you violated my rights because I was supposed to get X dollars and because of your stupid work, I'm getting X minus nine dollars, and I'm harmed. So the question is, was this the proper format? Was Thule properly filed as a direct action? Is this the type of right a shareholder is harmed directly? Right, so the question I asked, can Thule sue directly because he is harmed, or does he have to sue derivatively? And the court says, we ask two simple questions. We do the Thule two-step. First question, who suffered the harm? <clears throat> who suffered the harm? 
and who would benefit from the recovery. Now this sounds simple, but in, in reality it takes a little bit of thought to, to play it out and, and to see that that is going to be, in this case, a derivative at best litigation for our friend Thule. Now at the end of the day, he did potentially get less money in his pocket, but the value of the company is the company's harm. If the company's value goes down, the shareholders are only harmed by virtue of having some ownership percentage in that. So anytime a board action diminishes the value of a company and its own value, it may seem like the shareholders are being harmed because they have less of a right to collect on that money, but this is really a harm to the company itself. The company is now worse off than it was before. The directors decided to drive the company into a brick wall and now the company is in worse shape than it was. The company waited to take action and so it has lost a certain amount of value. Now, to Danielle's point, in addition to that, we also have a circumstance where it's not clear the value went down at all. It's not clear that the value of the company was harmed at all. But we still, as a preliminary matter, we first reject the direct action. This is not a right of a shareholder. This is a right of the company. The company, the directors, owe a duty to the company to make actions that are going to maximize the value of the company. That's a right that the directors owe to the company. And here the company became less valuable because of an action of the directors, therefore the company suffered the harm, and moreover, if the suit was successful, who gets paid? The directors would have to pay the corporation for the harm they, pay, they caused because of the breach of the duty they owed to the corporation. They didn't fulfill their duty of care because they made a bad business judgment, We'll see later that those cases rarely win, but fundamentally we're in a world where we're talking about harm to the company. And so we see that direct actions are going to be relatively rare based on a movement in stock value. Instead, these direct actions, these class actions, are going to generally regard some type of violation to the shareholder's rights directly. And the shareholders have three main areas to have those rights in statute. The 33 Act and the 34 Act provides a number of rights. Delaware state law provides certain rights to shareholders, especially regarding voting. And as we talk about in venture capital law, they may have contractual rights as well. You know, you might be a big shareholder, you own 15% of a private company, and you have the right to put someone on the board. Um, a couple other tweaks here, the plaintiff who wins in a, in a class action in general can get generally recover attorney's fees and, as we'll see in a minute, because this is a direct action, because of harm to the shareholder personally, we don't have to ask the board for permission. We don't, we're not, we're the board, the company is not suing anyone, the company is not a part of this litigation, it's a direct litigation, it does not involve the company. And so we don't have to worry about what we'll see is called the demand requirement. And in addition, the other appeal is that this being a class action, the plaintiff can recover attorney's fees. There are some requirements for direct litigation. This is not a course on civil procedure, so I will defer to Civ Pro 2 when you will learn about class actions or have learned about class actions. But effectively, we're following Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23 which requires numerosity and commonality of the class. You have to go through a class certification process. And usually that's really easy when you have common shareholders because there are usually a lot of them. It's a public company, you could have millions of them. And they all are common stockholders and they're all harmed in the exact same way, usually. The date of the meeting was moved without notice. So none of them got to vote. That's a commonality of interest. You have a large class. So usually class certification is easy in these cases. The problem is, as we saw in Thule, there aren't a lot of harms that are very valuable. So shareholders would prefer a lot of stuff to be direct litigation. They have a lot more control. They can recover attorney's fees. It's easy to get the class certified. But there are very few rights that are rights of shareholders qua shareholders. <laughs> Most of those rights pertain to the corporation. In addition, things did get a little harder after the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 
1995. Um, which created a new requirement that the... So it used to be effectively that the first person to file the case would become the lead plaintiff, which was very um, remunerative, very profitable to, to be in that role of lead plaintiff. If you, were the, you wanted to be the attorney, you wanted to be the lead plaintiff. Uh, but the uh, PSLRA put a new requirement that said the lead plaintiff had to be the most capable of adequately representing the interests of the class members. So generally had to become a large shareholder. I mean, it used to be that companies, uh, plaintiff's law firms, would have sort of a data bank of old folks in Florida that had like a couple thousand bucks worth of a bunch of different stocks. No, literally. And like you'd call up so-and-so, you know, you know, Herman Schwartzberg down in Palm Beach and be like, hey, we need to file a case. We'd like to be named plaintiff. Okay, go ahead. And you know now that requirement has changed to generally being the largest shareholder or a very large shareholder, which has made it definitely harder to file these, these class actions uh, in general. Derivative litigation, on the other hand, is a lawsuit filed by the stockholder on behalf of the company. That's why it's called derivative. And it claims that the manager breached duties owed to the company. And we're going to spend the next month talking about what all of those duties are. It also means that the recovery goes to the company. It's the company who owns the duty. It's the director that harmed the company. And so the payout goes to the company, and that is thought to increase shareholder value. Query whether or not the expense of litigation always does, and as we'll see, there's lots of ways that directors can avoid liability uh, and, and cause the company to pay for this litigation anyway. So there's some kind of weird quirks to that. Uh, Plaintiff can generally require, uh, recover uh, attorney's fees in some of these litigations, but it's not as clear-cut as with class actions. Uh, and there may be insurance that pays out. Uh, but there's a fundamentally different procedure in addition to this fundamentally different right. The different procedure is that derivative litigation requires making demand on the board. And so we'll talk about that in some detail, about that demand requirement. Other things you need to know about derivative litigation, in addition to the fact that it is generally, the, so key points, derivative litigation, generally what you need to file if it's a change in the stock price. If the value of the company goes down, that's probably a derivative litigation scenario, not a direct litigation scenario, because the company is harmed, because you can think of it, its own value has gone down, and so when that stock price dips, we're probably looking at a derivative litigation. And who can sue? So they have to actually have the shares when the suit is filed and maintain them throughout the litigation. And they have to obtain court approval from Delaware for any settlement. And so we're going to talk about that in more detail in just a minute. Uh, and we're going to talk about those. Uh, but um, by the way, it's, a, it's Delaware Rule 23.1, so it's kind of similar, kind of a quasi-class action concept. Uh, but uh, we, we'll have a whole kind of slideshow on, on that as well. So why does this matter? Why do people kind of get up in arms about it? Well, because causing the company to sue its directors is an exercise of business judgment. Ca the, the company's decision to sue anyone, the company's decision to defend a lawsuit, to take on a lawsuit in its own name for its own recovery is a business decision. And who makes decisions for the company? The board. And who is making this decision to sue? The shareholders. So we have a fundamental problem here. We have a fundamental problem because the business judgment rule says that directors have the discretion effectively to decide whether the company sues or not. But the directors are not going to sue themselves. So a derivative action challenges the whole concept of the business judgment rule and becomes a fairly thorny area, at least theoretically, of corporate law. And we're going to learn about that business judgment rule uh, next week. All right, so to close out then this section, I want you to keep in mind a series of items that would qualify as direct or derivative. On the left, we have uh, uh, harms uh, to, to rights, which would generally trigger a direct lawsuit, a class action lawsuit, a lawsuit because of harm to shareholders, qua shareholders. On the right side of the board, we have derivative actions where the corporation is harmed by the action of the directors and the corporation has the ability to sue. 
and the shareholders potentially can cause the corporation to sue. So looking at the derivative, the direct side of the ledger, the side where we're going to have a class action, a direct action where the shareholders' rights themselves are harmed, this regards their financial rights like non-payment of a dividend which was owed, right? That's your money into your pocket. A dividend is fundamentally different. That's the company saying we're going to distribute the company's money to the shareholders. Board doesn't do it. That's a harm to your pocketbook in a way that simply changing the stock price does not. Harming your voting rights. Changing the annual meeting. So you don't have the ability to, to vote at it. Right? Governance rights, right? Forcing the meeting to be earlier or otherwise messing with any of the rights that you have to govern the company. Those are rights that you have. Look, a shareholder might have a right to govern the company badly, effectively. I mean, in fact, the whole idea is that shareholders are thought to be worse at managing the company than the board. That's why the board has the power to manage the company. So it's, it's certainly not a foregone conclusion that shareholders losing their rights to vote is a harm to the corporation. It might be that shareholders losing their right to vote is the best thing for the corporation because shareholders are stupid or rationally apathetic or ill-informed or just in a bad position to make decisions. But they have certain rights. If those rights are violated, we have a direct action. On the other side, derivative actions. When a, I, we'll talk about this in the duty of loyalty, a, a usurpation of a corporate opportunity. Director has an opportunity that comes his way, an opportunity for, to, uh, you know, you, you, you run uh, Coca-Cola. There's an opportunity to buy a, uh, a, a small soda distributor in Iowa. And instead of sending it to the board, you think that's a really good price on that. I'm going to buy it myself, and I'm going to run that soda distributor. And I have some great connections at Coca-Cola, so I'm sure I'll get a bottling contract. That's a problem. That's usurping a corporate opportunity. The corporation lost an opportunity. The directors stole from the corporation. The corporation's value is harmed thereby. Waste of corporate assets. The corporation has a million bucks. Let's just give it away to charity. Okay, maybe corporate social responsibility is a good idea, but there are lawsuits. All right, this was the Ford case. Ford said, look, we're just going to spend our corporate treasury on making cars cheaper so more people can have cars. And by the way, shareholders who have my competitors, meh, problem. Uh, problem for the corporation. Uh, interested director transactions where the business judgment rule does not function because there's not a presumption that the director is acting impartially. And uh, poor performance due to a lack of attention or care. Again, driving the value of the corporation down. So, to summarize, you need to understand when a case will likely be direct and likely be derivative and some of the core implications from that distinction. So, there are some debates about whether shareholder lawsuits are good or bad at all, and it's an empirical question inherently, and there has been some litigation that has meant to clean up some of that, but the debate continues. We have seen that there are certain rights, which are rights of shareholders, qua shareholders, rights that they own. And those are direct rights that they can sue directly through a class action. There are other rights that effectively harm the corporation's value. Those are derivative rights. Delaware has an approach called the Thule two-step, where we simply ask who suffered the harm and who gets the benefit, and that helps us identify whether or not we go into one or two of these buckets. We talked briefly about direct litigation, very briefly, effectively follows the rules of class action. We talked a little bit about derivative litigation. We're going to talk more about that in the next set of slides. And you should be aware that there is a tension inherent in, direct li in derivative litigation. It inherently conflicts with the business judgment rule. It makes it difficult to square with the idea that the corporation is run by the directors. But at the same time, we have a reality that directors don't sue themselves. And sometimes they can commit wrongdoing. If we did not have derivative action and a way to have shareholders cause the corporation to sue its directors, we would effectively not be able to enforce fiduciary duties. But it has an inherent tension in the law because it undermines the principle that the directors and not the shareholders decide what the corporation does, including who it sues. Any questions on the topic?